everybody. Welcome back to Spatial Statistics. So last time we ended on this slide where I was calling on us to kind of start practicing recognizing spatial patterns and thinking about how we're going to build a statistical model. Uh, to, for example, for air quality in Colorado and Southern Wyoming. Uh, I thought about, okay, you might be able to map out I think I'm able to map out the sources of this pollution. You might be able to think about things like uh, spatial covariates, like elevation, which elevation gets pretty high up west of this line right over here. You might be able to use things like large scale variation, and, and these are called different things. Sometimes they're called a spatial trend is the other way, spatial gradient. Sometimes it's called a spatial trend. If you have readings at set points in say Wellington and Fort Collins, Estes Park, you know, Millican and Longmont, then you can go ahead and just use them as quantitative covariates in this regression model. And then the thing that we will spend quite a bit of time talking about is, okay, what do we do with everything that is left over? After you account for these things, after you account for maybe distance and those sources of pollution, elevation, and a spatial trend, what are you left with? What is the residual process that is left over? What does that look like? And if I scroll back to this slide, after we build our regression model, we really hope that we get something that resembles this and not this. Because we hope that our covariates, everything that we can measure and account for reliably, we really hope that picks up all the systematic variation. We really hope that what is then left over is as close to noise as possible. And the leftmost panel there, there is no spatial correlation in that data. Anything that we're picking up with our human eye is just patterns that we're imagining. Our, our eyes are great at picking out patterns. From that paper, the authors generated the data with no spatial correlation present at all. So that is an example of an example, that's the key, it's and just one example of what a spatially uncorrelated process might look like. The two panels on the right, there is some spatial correlation present, and in fact, spatial correlation in panel two is greater than the spatial correlation in this panel right here. So what we're hoping as we're kind of setting off in this class and we're thinking about these models and, and model building, we use all the information available. And how much information is available to us will depend a lot on who was responsible uh, for collecting the data. Are you just using a database that is already out there or are you the one that is going out into the field with a GPS and collecting everything that you need to know? Even if you have a very well-planned study, you still could retain some of this small scale spatial variability that can end up looking like one of these two panels. And then this class comes in useful. If, if you go ahead and account for all the information that you have, you plot your residuals, you plot everything that's left over, and it's looking more like this left-hand panel, your regression analysis class is sufficient. Um, this class has methodology to address the other case. When you account for all the information that you have, and then what is left over is looking more like the two panels on the right. Okay. Now, by the way, what's the, what's the hurt in using our spatial methods um, in, in the case that the residuals, what is left over, is looking uncorrelated? Your model would then be over-parameterized. over -param you can write that down. We want to avoid spatial models that 
if residuals are independent. Because you don't want to have a model that is more complex than necessary. That will be an example of overfitting. That will be an example of over parameterization, which is just different ways of saying the same thing. You will be estimating more things than you need to to represent the process of interest. Okay, so that was a quick review. Let's move on. In spatial statistics, it's widely recognized they have three types of spatial data. One, two, and three. I'm actually gonna go ahead and start with this one, aerial data or sometimes called lattice data, because it's probably the easiest to kind of um, conceptualize. These two can be tough to distinguish and we'll, we'll spend a little bit more time on them. So I'm starting with aerial or lattice data. So it's an outcome variable that is aggregated. Most often it's some kind of a percent. Most often it's some kind of a rate like an incidence rate or a mortality rate or uh, some kind of a percentage or some kind of a count. And it's aggregated to some kind of known fixed geographic areas. So these could be states, counties, census tracts, block groups, blocks, regions, divisions, countries, continents. Now, of course I'm being facetious. If you're aggregating data to the scale of continents, you really ought to rethink your, your research question. And if you're working uh, with a unit as small as block group, your total area of interest better not be the entire country. We will be in trouble. I, I'm sure, correct me if I'm wrong, that's some of that uh, participation um, opportunity, but I, I am actually not aware of a single study out there that is uh, for the entire United States at say a block group level. So of these four geographic units, I did write them in order of size. Say states are bigger than counties, counties are bigger than census tracts, census tracts are bigger than block groups. And then there is of course blocks, census blocks that um, make up block groups. We just had a census person come by to ask us a few questions. So I am not aware of a national level analysis where the data is collected, aggregated to block group or smaller scale. I may have seen one study and I'm, I'm even forgetting the name of it, but maybe I'm sure there's been one study at the national level where um, the data has been aggregated to census tract level. County level maps are, and analyses are, are done all the time. Um, for example, uh, most famously recently, a lot of the COVID data has been aggregated to county level and that's available publicly widely. Uh, there's a Hopkins uh, database where things are available by county. And of course, also by country, um, if you're looking at the entire world. So that's called aerial or lattice data. It's, it's quite popular in public health because when you aggregate a health outcome, uh, you don't have to worry about things like privacy concerns. And maybe that's another reason why there's not a ton of analyses at the block group level. You really want to give people, of course, privacy if you're dealing with health outcomes. Um, aggregating a health outcome to a county level should be just fine. When you start to get down into a block level, you can really figure out who it is. If you have even something like gender or age, you're like, oh, okay, it's, it's so-and-so who lives in this block in this city. You can pretty easily figure out what health issue they have. So um, authorities try to prevent that from happening. That's why um, most of the data analysis is performed at a county or state level. Um, and this type of data is incredibly prevalent in public health, um, but not solely in public health, but mostly in public health. Okay, we'll tackle 
the methods for this uh, later in the course, towards the end of the course, in fact. So the other two uh, methods, let me jump up to number one. This is called point reference data, or sometimes called geostatistical data. So we now have an outcome variable that is recorded at n known fixed coordinates. So I will be talking about coordinates in just a sec, but you're, you're thinking of, okay, latitude and longitude. One of the most common examples of this are weather stations. You have um, the latitude and longitude for different weather stations, and the weather stations are recording things like air temperature, air pressure, humidity, air quality, so the amount of particulate matter in the air. The coordinates are fixed, and it's helpful to think of an actual physical weather station sitting somewhere on the side of a mountain or, or on a building or in the forest. You know the location of this weather station, and it's just you know, capturing the air, measuring things. Maybe it's measuring the amount of cosmic radiation that is hitting a certain plate. So this is key because the coordinates, the location is fixed. I'm sure it is possible to move a weather station, but it is not common when they're moved. The outcome, what is being measured, is actually a random variable. It is something that has information contained therein. And it can be continuous, something like temperature, pressure, humidity. It can be binary. You can um, measure, for example, and I'm blanking for, you know, for a realistic example, but you can, for example, set up uh, wildlife cameras in known fixed locations. And the wildlife cameras will measure the presence of a particular species of bird or maybe the wolf, a particular kind of wolf in the, in the middle of nowhere in the forest. It can be a count, so anything that, that is binary can also be a count, not whether or not there you saw your wildlife camera captured a wolf, but how many wolves did it capture? In fact, the little knowledge I have about wolves, participation um, idea, the little knowledge I have about wolves is that wolves travel in packs, so it's probably unlikely that you will see a lone wolf um, captured by a wildlife camera somewhere. Categorical is just, I, I'm trying to list every possible random variable that I know. I think I, I got them all. Okay, fixed location, you're measuring things. Uh, what you are measuring is a random variable. What you are assuming in theory, what you are assuming in theory is that you could have placed your little wildlife camera, you could have placed your weather station anywhere in continuous space. And so you could have obtained your temperature, your pressure, your whether or not the wolf lives there anywhere in your space. But you have um, chosen these locations. Where you have put your weather stations is not interesting, but what is recorded by the weather stations is interesting. The coordinates can be in two dimensions, so latitude, longitude, or they can be in three dimensions, latitude, longitude, and depth, for example. If you're dealing with mineral extraction, if you're dealing with oil extraction, natural gas extra extraction, latitude, longitude, and depth is very important. If you're building a bridge and trying to test the soil for stability, latitude, longitude, and depth is very important. Um, if you're dealing with predicting things like turbulence in, in the sky, latitude, longitude, and elevation is very important. However, I'd say about, in my experience, 95% or more studies out there are in two dimensions. Um, maybe it's the fields that I uh, work with the most. Maybe if you work with folks in, in uh, engineering and geology, maybe this is different. But in my experience, I'd say over 95% of all studies don't have a depth or a altitude component to them. It's hard enough with just latitude and longitude. Um, trust me, there, there's enough to do with just uh, two dimensions uh, as far as the coordinates go. Okay, so for geostatistical data, 
the key is the thing doing the measuring is at a fixed location and you don't really care where that location is. Now, to be clear, you don't place weather stations randomly, right? You, you need to have some kind of road access and needs to have internet connection. It's not that they are placed randomly, it's that there is no scientific benefit in you knowing why it was placed there and not there. So this changes completely when we deal with point pattern data. On its surface, it's annoyingly similar to point reference data or geostatistical data. But now it's the coordinates that are considered a random variable. We think it's the locations that carry information, the locations that are interesting to analyze. And what is being recorded at each location is not interesting or it's just fixed. So you are recording, if I go back to my wolf example, if you are sending a team of graduate students or, or postdocs, that's why you write NSF grants, right? A colleague of mine just got an NSF grant. 80% um, of, um, of the budget is uh, salaries for 12 postdocs. I can see if you really cared where uh, the wolves are, a certain kind of wolf, a certain species of wolf in the Northern Colorado, Southern Wyoming area, you can possibly send a team of people out to record where there was evidence of presence of these wolves. So what you are recording at every point is wolf. That is not a random variable. That is a fixed piece of information. What is changing and what is of scientific interest is where. Where are your events of interest now, where might they go next? Not how much of something is there. So if, if this is a confusing distinction, I have some examples coming up, but um, on the, you know, it's important to think through the exact scientific question that you're asking. In theory, our events can happen anywhere. But the n points, no matter if, if, it's, if n is a million or 10, but the number of points, however, wherever the points you observed, are just one of many possible realizations of some process. If you're studying the um, locations of wildfires in this area, then whatever data you collect, whether it's one year, one decade, the last 50 years, that is just one possible random variable the locations themselves, right, whether it's 2D or 3D. That is one realization of the forest fire spatial process. So you think that in theory, there is another possible realization of this forest fire spatial process that exists in a parallel universe. So by building a statistical model, you're trying to tease out what are the, what are the systematic variables that promote the fire in certain locations and not in other locations? Could it be elevation? Could it be slope? Could it be um, how dry the air is? The answer is probably yes to all of those. But what are the directions of those variables? Which one is most important when we account for others? So to recap, I think the aerial data analysis uh, is, is relatively easy to identify. We're aggregating things to, to um, geographic areas like states, counties, block groups, et cetera. Point reference data, the locations themselves are fixed. There's like a building or a camera, but you, you don't really care for scientific purposes where the reading was done. You care about the reading itself. Point pattern data, you care far less about the reading. You care about where the spatial pattern of where the readings occurred. Let's look at some examples. So why do we care about, about the differentiating between the three types? The exploratory data analysis that we perform is different. The statistical models we fit are different. The um, you know, inference we draw is different. And the software we use is different. 
So it's important when you're starting out to kind of recognize what broad family um, your analysis belongs to. So the slide number nine refuses to come up. Let's try again. All right, point reference data. So on the left is probably one of the first examples of this. This is just a, a, a field of wheat. And the, this field of wheat has uh, an X coordinate. This is unlikely, uh, or it's definitely not a, a longitude. It's, uh, it might be meters. It's that, or it might be just a number, right? Each one of these patches is a plot of 3.3 by 2.6 meters. And so if you're plotting this in a field, you might just not number them from a particular point and you're just going one, two, three, up to 80, and then up one, two, three, up to 50. So what I'm trying to demonstrate with this example is your coordinates need not be meters, need not be latitude and longitude. It could be something arbitrary like uh, a plot number a row and column number. Just fine, the methods are gonna work because it's a known fixed coordinate. What you care about is how much wheat is produced, right? The squares are coded to show the yield of wheat in pounds. The light colored ones produce a lot of wheat. The dark colored, colored ones produce relatively little wheat. So spatial correlation, high among high and low among low. This is a real data set, right? This is not as clear as the, gener the simulated data set from the one paper from a few slides ago. But look, here is sort of a big area where not a ton of wheat was produced. And here we have sort of a bigger area where more wheat was produced. Here we have, I don't know, I don't know, it's a real data set, you know, and right now we're just working on uh, um, analyzing these visually. Of course, we will have more formal tools to assess the strength of spatial correlation in the data. But I'm just pointing out how I would kind of go about visually analyzing this plot. Is there, um, is there some kind of large spatial trend? Maybe in this direction, Maybe there is some kind of, uh, the field is not perfectly level, maybe it's sloping. So there is runoff, uh, so water runs off. There is more wheat on this side, so maybe water possibly runs off to this direction. I don't know, but I'm seeing that there is generally more wheat on the left-hand side of that plot than on the right-hand side of the plot. So if I was gonna start to model this, I, I might include the x coordinate as a possible covariate and then assess what do the residuals look like after I've done that. Okay. Our next example is just, you know, shameless self-promotion or uh, a convenient picture that I've, a map that I've made. If it's a map that I've made, why not just go ahead and feature it? So this is the indoor gamma radiation dose rate for about 10,199, it's not about, it's 10,199 residential locations around the UK. UK, of course, is made up of Scotland, Northern Ireland, Wales, and England. I believe I didn't forget any. So first off, in no way are the residential locations randomly placed on a map. Why would we expect that to be the case? People don't throw a dart on a map and that's where they're gonna live, right? This is just where uh, the locations themselves follow the population density of, of, of the UK. But what we cared about in this project is predicting how much cosmic radiation people are exposed to around the UK. There is a thought that um, if you are exposed to a lot of cosmic radiation in your childhood, we could see a higher level of childhood leukemia. And so that was the hypothesis that we were um, uh, pursuing. So lighter areas up here and here by Cornwall. So there's uh, um, cities like Leeds and Manchester out here. This is Cornwall, right over here is London. So notice that we do have 
Light blue areas tend to be around light blue areas. Dark blue areas tend to be around dark blue areas. There is spatial correlation in this data, but this is an example of a realistic sort of weak to moderate spatial correlation. If there's something happening, it's happening at a relatively small scale. And there's good reason for that, by the way. Um, it has to do with what the houses are made of. Because local geology has uh, a lot to do with um, attenuating uh, cosmic gamma, ray gamma radiation. How did I learn that? Well, I, I talked to the people who collected the data uh, and they taught me this. So important as a statistician to always, always learn as much as possible about the data. So again, um, this is a point reference data set because the houses themselves are at known fixed locations. It's rare that a building up and moves. And what we care about is the reading at those locations. In this case, it's the uh, cosmic dose rate in nano gray per hour. Okay, last example. Oops. Last example is the maximum temperatures in the southeastern United States. Uh, it's from a, a paper by Brian Reich, who I believe is still a professor at North Carolina State University, um, and a spatial statistician that I, I, um, I respect um, tremendously. Um, so this is an example of fairly clear, strong spatial correlation. The warm areas tend to be around other warm areas. The cool areas tend to be around other cool areas. You can very strongly see the effect of elevation, right? So here we have the mountains. And of course, up in the mountains, the, the maximum temperature is going to be lower. As we get towards the coast, um, the uh, temperatures are going to increase. Okay, again, where did these readings occur? At weather stations. The weather stations don't move. We don't necessarily care where the weather stations are. They were placed there a long time before we got there. What we care about most for this particular example is what is measured at each weather station. Okay, next are the point pattern data. So look, at first glance, they look very similar. We have points on a map. But at this, because we're dealing with point pattern data, we now say that the locations themselves are a random variable, two-dimensional random variable. So we don't care necessarily what is measured. We care where it is measured. So the first example are two types of cancer. So these cancer types of cancer are related. And uh, interestingly enough, colon and rectum cancer are both uh, the incidence is rising amongst millennials. That's young people. I'm a millennial. Some of you guys are probably millennials. So the incidence of these two kinds of cancer has been rising pretty steadily among the millennials. So looking at the map, we know that um, there is more, or it, it looks like there is more colon cancer than rectum cancer. Uh, that makes sense. Colon cancer is more um, common. So what we're looking at is are the spatial patterns of colon and rectum cancer similar or different? And with your naked eye, I don't think you could tell. But if you um, read up on this paper, they compare the, the spatial pattern of these two kinds of cancer, and they hypothesize that if the spatial patterns are similar, then there is perhaps an under, underlying common risk factor that is driving the similarity in the spatial patterns. Again, spatial patterns in what? Spatial patterns in the locations. These are residential locations of patients with one of two kinds of cancer up in the uh, Minneapolis Twin Cities area. So the middle panel is perhaps the, the first and one of the most famous applications of spatial statistics. It was done by John Snow. No, not that one. Uh, but this, these are the residential locations of people who died from cholera around the Broad Street pump. And in fact, you can't even see that easily where the Broad Street pump is. It's right over there. There's a little dot. That is the Broad Street pump, right? These, these, this is what pumps look like on this map. And you can see that if you imagine concentric distances 
around the Broad Street pump and using these concentric distances as a covariate for the density of cholera deaths, cholera death locations, you would probably conclude that the closer you get to this pump, the higher the density of cholera deaths becomes. So look, all of these points, if you were gonna record a column of data, they're all cholera death, right? That is a fixed outcome. What is of interest and what is different here are the residential locations. Finally, the third example, um, I just you know, made this a few days ago. These are wildfire locations across the United States. There's a good reason I chose to not zoom in on our sort of neighborhood of the United States. Look, there's actually none east of a certain longitude. There's actually no wildfires at all east of maybe this one right here in South Dakota. So there's a very clear covariate that was controlling um, the density and intensity of wildfires. You can think of it as either um, you know, your longitude, you can think of it as the amount of forest to burn, but you know, there's forest, uh, there is some forest in the Eastern US you can think of it as elevation. So perhaps it's amount of forest, which is fuel, plus elevation, which controls things like um, how dry the air is. And that contributes to how densely, um, why all the wildfire locations in this data set are mostly or entirely in the West. Of course, if we were to zoom in on the Western US, we, we have to think about a different set of covariates. It wouldn't be useful anymore to have longitude as a covariate. It might be something like elevation or slope or even direction of the valley, right? Because uh, how does wildfire spread? I'm not a wildfire expert. That's a participation opportunity if you'd like, but I imagine you know, wind location um, and higher wind speeds contribute to the spread of wildfires. So, your covariates will change if, the, if your scale changes. But that might be obvious, but I just wanted to say that. All right. Our third and final example of spatial data, aerial or lattice data, we're thinking of aggregating an outcome um, to some um, geographic region. Go back to the UK, in this case, it's Scotland. If you ever visit Scotland, Glasgow and uh, Edinburgh are beautiful. Here we are looking at lip cancer mortality. Um, it's, lip cancer is interesting because there's a actually um, specific kind of cells on the bottom of your lip. And it's the bottom of your lip, if you think about it, that is exposed to UV radiation, much more on the top of your lip, just based on the fact that it's the bottom lip. And in this study, in the original study, they um, were trying to use a covariate of the percentage of people employed uh, by forestry and fishery, because those are the people who spend almost all of their day outside and therefore exposing their bottom lip to more and more UV radiation. But what they concluded is even after you account for that covariate at the, I think they're called district level, there's still a small scale spatial process that is left over. So this is an example of fairly strong spatial correlation. The areas of high mortality tend to be around touching, right? With aerial data, we think of adjacency. They're, they're sharing a border or sharing a, a vertex. So the areas of high mortality tend to be adjacent to other areas of high mortality. Areas of medium mortality are together and areas of low mortality are together. And according to the authors, um, a lot of the systematic variation is um, controlled by the percentage of the population employed by forestry and fisheries, which is a proxy, proxy variable. It's trying to measure sort of UV exposure on the lip.
That is not that is by by by, by far not the only risk factor. Smoking, for example, could be a risk a uh, risk factor for lip cancer. But um, but that is what the authors did in the study. Some more shameless self promotion in the in the middle panel. But again, if uh, if you're kind of proud of a map you made, why not throw it in there? So I'm kind of proud of these two maps. Uh, this is the the risk relative risk of overdose fatal uh, fatal drug overdose in the United States. This is the age adjusted trend over time um, around the United States. Notice that I'm working at the state level, so it's pretty easy to see the strong spatial correlation in the bottom panel. The states with a really high, really troubling trend over time are all together, except for Alaska. That is an island out, you know, out there. Alaska is considered to be an island because it is not touching any other U.S. state. Hawaii is an island because, well, it's an archipelago. It, it is li literally out in the middle of the ocean. But when we look at the entire country, the states with the highest trends are together. And then the states with some, you know, maybe not as high, but still really high trends are together. Then there is like, as we go further west, the, the trends over time flatten out. And so the bottom panel represents fairly strong spatial correlation. The top panel, which is relative risk, and you think of, a, and you think of this as being the average overdose rate, not the trend over time, but the average overdose rate. For that, when you kind of eyeball this top panel, you're looking at what might resemble a checkerboard pattern. Blue states sometimes are touching red states. In this case, blue states are um, lower than average in risk, and red states are higher than average in risk. Look at the Northeast. We have blue states touching red states, blue states touching red states. So this is an example of relatively weak spatial correlation. In fact, um, it is weak to moderate. And uh, with our eye, it's hard to see any at all. The third panel, the third example on this slide comes from um, a paper by Brian Nealon at the Medical University of South Carolina. He's another uh, pretty well-known spatial statistician that I, I respect the work of a lot. Um, so these are ER, emergency room expenditures, by block group. And that's why I wanted to present this, because um, I think the authors had to purchase this data set, because I'm not aware of a public database that has um, a spatial data to this level of detail. It's also really hard. It becomes really difficult to tell uh, whether data are spatially correlated by I, because, you know, do we, can we really tell what's going on in there? There are so many little block groups. Uh, this is Durham, North Carolina. In the, in the middle of the city, the block groups are really teeny tiny. So we really have to rely on spatial statistics to help us out. So I, I mentioned some of this already, the typical research questions. We'll have more examples as we explore um, these three types of spatial data further. But here are the most sort of the, the headliner, the, the most typical kinds of research questions. For point reference data, you're usually trying to predict your outcome at locations that you don't have your weather stations. You're trying to predict air quality where you have no reading yet. You're saying, if I could put an air station there, then uh, a weather station there, this is what my prediction would be. And this is called Krieging. And I'm always, uh, I always found it funny that it's actually named after a, a gold miner named Danny Krieg, who was trying to find gold. So he, they were sampling the soil for gold, and they were trying to predict how much gold was in the unsampled soil. And that's where the word, the word Krieging comes from. Krieging is synonymous with spatial prediction. Depending on the field, those two words will be used interchangeably. 
For aerial and lattice data, you're usually trying to smooth out the outcome of interest. If, you, if we go back to the one by, by one slide to the block group data, you can imagine that the population of each block group varies wildly. Some block groups are very densely populated and so you're getting a very good reading of ER expenditures. Some block groups probably have a lot less population and this varies wildly. And so what you're trying to do is you're trying to borrow information. You're trying to borrow information from your neighbors trying to look at the neighborhood of counties. You're trying to look at the neighborhood of block groups. You're trying to look at the neighborhood of states. And if there is a sp spatial correlation present, it will help you predict the outcome of interest better than just taking that reading alone. And this is sometimes called small area estimation or SAE. Point patterns, I briefly mentioned the example with the Broad Street pump. You can examine the influence of covariates like distance to a source, and you can see how the density of your outcomes changes with distance to a source. You can also compare and contrast, oh, there's some thunder. You can also compare and contrast the um, underlying intensity between different kinds of outcomes, between I flip back between colon and rectum cancer, between cases and controls, between different kinds of plant species. Because again, remember for point patterns, the locations themselves are of interest. What you're measuring takes a secondary, takes a sort of a backseat. Okay, all of the above, the spatial methods will help us um, correctly account for spatial correlation correctly estimate uncertainty, hopefully make better predictions, have better confidence intervals, and of course the magical or all important p-values. Whether or not, no matter what you think of p-values, it's always better to have correct p-values uh, than incorrect p-values. Okay, so what I would like to do is get us just a couple of slides further and then next time spend uh, most of the time um, looking at making and looking at maps. Uh, and so really, maybe just this one slide. I just want to go through this one slide to just put um, some ideas into our head over the weekend. Um, this is the long break that we have. So I like to just introduce some stuff so that um, if you happen to look at a globe over the weekend, you'll, uh, you might think back, oh, remember that, uh, you know, incredible spatial statistics class I had on Thursday that um, taught me something about latitudes and longitudes. Okay, this is our planet, uh, Earth. In reality, it's of course tilted, but this is uh, a model, of course. Um, our spatial locations, I'm introducing our first bit of important notation. Um, spatial locations are going to be a, a bolded S. They are a bolded S, S for spatial locations. It's gonna be a bolded S because it's actually going to be a vector, right? Because a spatial location is indexed by latitude and longitude and depth and elevation. So that's what the bold character is indicating that that is actually um, uh, not a scalar, but a vector. Our locations are identified by a coordinate pair, most often longitude and latitude. And here I am, whoop, here, okay, my computer has a mind of its own. Try it again. Here I'm listing longitude first because, and this is actually a common error that I make and I see students make, we tend to say lat long. We tend to say, what's the latitude and longitude? Latitude and longitude. But the latitude are the y's, right? But when you're in mathematics, you tend to think of x's first. And so it's helpful if you think of longitude first, because it corresponds to the x's, and latitude second, because it corresponds to a y's. Your maps will be actually transposed if you put 
your latitude where longitude goes and your longitude where the latitude is supposed to go. And you're going to be very confused. Um, you will be able to recognize that if you're mapping something like the United States and you know what the United States should look like. But if you get um, residential locations of colon cancer, you don't know what those are supposed to look like. And to perform the analysis correctly, you really want the longitudes to be the X's, which are your horizontal position. And you want the latitudes to be your Y's, which is the vertical position on the map, to correctly map. And then in the future, when we're dealing with direction, we really, really, really want you know, your horizontal position and vertical position to be exact. Okay, some nomenclature. This is the time, I know, nomenclature, not particularly exciting, but this is the time to think about it. That was pretty cool. So longitudes are sometimes called meridians. Have I ever seen this in a spatial statistics paper? No, but perhaps we should put it in. Latitudes are called parallels. Uh, and again, that too, I have never seen in a spatial statistics paper. Maybe you have, uh, participation opportunity. They're measured in decimal degrees, but formally, a degree can be divided into 60 minutes and then further into 60 seconds. Have I ever seen uh, anything besides decimal degrees in a spatial statistics paper? I have not. So I'm presenting the range of possibilities that you could run into, but almost always you're dealing with longitudes, latitudes, notice I'm saying longitude first, in decimal degrees. So something like 45.5 degrees, not 45 degrees and 30 minutes, okay? That's what I mean by decimal degrees, 45.5 degrees. Why is it a degree? Well, let's look at just over here. So the degree is actually the degree between the equator and this line right here, which identifies our latitudes. So these guys right here are our latitudes. These guys right here are our longitudes, just to be clear. And the degrees are reflecting of this angle right here. Now you will notice that the latitudes are all equally spaced. The latitudes, to make sure I said that correctly, the latitudes are all equally spaced. The longitudes, however, the longitudes converge at the poles and diverge at the equator, right? So we, if, we, if we look right here, the longitudes are going to converge at the poles and be much wider apart at the equator. So this is, this is the reason why lat long, so I'm being a little difficult here, lat long distances can be tough to think about. One degree of latitude, one degree of latitude is movement upwards. One degree of latitude is something like this. That's five, it's 15 degrees, but you get it. One degree of latitude is always approximately 111 kilometers. But one degree of longitude, which is moving left to right, so moving east to west, varies. It is also 111 degrees at the equator. So at the equator, you will notice that what, our, what happens is you actually get squares or something that is virtually indistinguishable from squares. And that's why at the equator, A degree of longitude is the same as a degree of latitude. But once we get up to 67 degrees north or 67 degrees south, 67 degrees north would be
up there. Now, as we go left to right, the longitudes converge and a degree of longitude is only 43 kilometers, less than half what it is at the equator. So we have to be very careful if we use distances just by default. If you input decimal degrees into R, your distances are also going to be in decimal degrees. But what that really means can really be distorted if you're working around the, the, the poles. If you are measuring data in northern Canada, if you're measuring data in Siberia, if you're measuring data in Greenland, a decimal degree distance you have to be really careful about. And that's why oftentimes, the last point on this slide, oftentimes, once you get your region of interest mapped, you're going to convert latitude longitude distances into northern, northing and easting. You're going to convert your degrees latitude, latitude of course is up and down, into northing meters or kilometers or even feet. You're going to convert your longitude, which is east to west, into easting meters or feet or kilometers or miles. So how much this matters varies by how big your area of interest is. And we will see some examples of that on the next slide. So today I covered the three types of spatial data. I talked about um, some important distinctions between those three types. We delved into a number of examples and the typical research questions. I also began to describe latitude, how latitudes and longitudes work. For example, when I say 67 degrees north, you kind of have an idea of what I'm referring to. 67 degrees south would be an equal angle, still 67 degrees, but just south of the equator. Equator being this line right over here. And you, are, you now have been warned about saying lat long, lat long, and then inputting lat long into Excel and an R, right? Because longitudes are X's and latitudes are Y's, really. You've been warned about distances from decimal degrees and where they might be misleading. They might be misleading if we are too far up or too far down on Earth. And that is why some data sets have something called northing and easting in meters. That way the distances themselves, if your coordinates are in meters, then, so it's actually the distance between your data point. Let's draw that. So here is a data point, and here is what is called your reference longitude then that this distance in meters would be your easting. How far to the east of your reference longitude is your data point? Same thing. If I draw a reference latitude, a reference latitude is just any given latitude, reference latitude, then the distance in meters between your data point and your reference latitude is your northing. If you convert your data into northing and easting, then all of your distances become far more convenient and they are, can be interpreted uh, much more readily as distances in meters, you know, we can scale them to kilometers, et cetera, centimeters, et cetera. Okay, let me pause here. Um, next time we will talk about things like projections. And this is, if this is feeling a lot like a geography class right now, you know, we're at an intersection, right? Statistics sits at an intersection of applied mathematics, data science, and 
geography, right? I mean, we, we can't talk about distances without talking about projections because of, I, I, here I go, I was gonna tell you I stopped, but I just couldn't help myself. This table right here, table 3.1, shows you how much the distances are affected uh, between an unprojected map, which is the worst possible map you can have, and a projected map. So you can see how much the distance from Atlanta to Seattle, Atlanta to Seattle, was affected. Look, it's almost 50%. So this will serve as a preview for next time. We will delve into projections a little bit and I will start to describe, um, I will post some R code, I will post some data so you guys can follow along as we start to make maps. Hey, look, I have both latitude and longitude and easting and northing. This is a preview. Um, we will make cool maps like this and like this next time. Guys, um, stay safe out there. Um, uh, thank you so much for your attention. Have a great weekend. I'll see you next time.